In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation. And as always, it's very good to be with you. Very good to be with you. And we'd like to start off our conversation by invoking Mary to be with us. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. When we conclude the rosary and we pray the Hail Holy Queen, we end by saying, invoking Mary as our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So right now, let's pray the prayer that Mary loves most and entrust our lives and our day and our salvation to Mary, <clears throat> as we say. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now that the hour of our death. Amen. And of course, today we'd like to start off our conversation by invoking our spiritual guide to be with us. Our spiritual guide is the uh, is the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit. He's known as the Paraclete, he's also known as the gift of gifts. Holy Spirit is also known as the sweet guest of our soul. Holy Spirit is also known as our consoler. He's also known as our counselor. He's also known as our Interior Master, and as St. Paul says in the first reading today, Romans 8, St. Paul says that, brothers and sisters, we don't know how to pray, but the Holy Spirit comes to our aid in our weakness. And he intercedes for us with ineffable groans so we can say, Abba, Abba, which means Daddy or Father. So let's invite our spiritual guide with great humility, but trust as the Holy Spirit to guide our, our talk, our conversation, our listening, our understanding, and our sanctification as we say the prayer to the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. Thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, it instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit. Granted by the same Spirit, may be truly wise, never rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Nasa Loyola, pray for us. St. Faustina, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So my friends, as is our custom i like to offer our prayers for you and prayers and especially through what is called the opus day the opus day means the work of god I'd like to pray for you in a special way for first of all for your sanctification that we would all on a daily basis strive to become the person that God wants us to be. God wants all of us to try strive for holiness of life. As our Lord said, be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. So let's pray that all of us will try to become saints. This is not a pious platitude or a cliche. It's a command. And God will never command us to do something that is beyond our 
reach. My next intention would be to pray for your children and teenagers that God would watch over them and protect them and help them. In the midst of so many temptations for young people today, I'd like to pray for you and your family and your children. There is a militant atheist, atheism that's spreading and also a, a militant transgenderism that is, is trying to poison the minds of your children. Let's do we all we can to protect and educate our children in the fear of the Lord, in the love for God, and the desire to, to obey His commandments. The world has gone through tough times, but we're going through a very difficult time now, so we have to stay close to God and be united in, in our, even our, our Perseverance family, to be united, supporting each other in this spiritual combat that we're all involved in. Because it's spiritual combat, we can't deny it. But we're on the side of the winners, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Amen. We're on the winning side, but we have to stay on this side and not jump ship. And then my third intention would be that all of us will try to pray more and pray better. We'd all try to upgrade our prayer life. We'd all try to Pray with greater fervor. For this we beg the Holy Spirit to help us. That's why I always start off our prayer by praying the Holy Spirit. That's my suggestion today that all of us rely more and more upon the work and the action of the Holy Spirit. Teresa of Avila, struggling in her prayer life, was talking with a Jesuit priest and he said, you got to pray more of the Holy Spirit. So once she started to pray more of the Holy Spirit, her prayer life was upgraded almost immediately. May we do the same. May we do the same. That is actually the, the beginning of our first reading. So let's move into our conversation on the readings for the day. We continue with Romans chapter 8. Then we have the responsorial psalm, which is Psalm 13. My hope, O Lord, is in your mercy. Then we move into Luke chapter 13. And we have a parable of Jesus. The parable of Jesus is elicited or brought, brought forth by someone in the crowd who asked him, Lord, are many to be saved? Very important question. Are many to be saved? Are many to be saved? So, Jesus says, try to enter in through the narrow path. That's what Jesus says. He answers indirectly. Try to enter in through the narrow path. Many will try to enter, but they will not be able to enter. Try to enter in through the, through the narrow path. But the question that the man asks is very important. Will many be saved? That's very important. The salvation of our, of our souls is the most important thing in the world, that all of us will be saved. 
Jesus will go on to say, what is the profit? What does it profit us if we gain the whole world and we lose our soul in the process? What does it profit us? Gaining the whole world and then we lose our soul. So let's go back through the readings and first reading we are reading for these the past two weeks we're reading the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. And the first verse today is, is very consoling and it should motivate us to rely more and more on the Holy Spirit. In which St. Paul says, that the Spirit comes to our aid in our weakness. We are very weak. The Holy Spirit comes to our aid in our weakness. We are very weak. Let me give you an example of how the Holy Spirit comes to our aid in our weakness and how the Holy Spirit can transform very weak people into valiant soldiers of Christ. It's the following. The second and third glorious mysteries. Second and third glorious mysteries. In the movie on the rosary that was basically put together by the working of Father Patrick Payton, known as the Rosary Priest, who says the family that prays together stays together. And a world at prayer is a world at peace. Patrick Payton. There is the presentation of the scene of the Ascension. After Jesus has risen from the dead and he's been appearing to the apostles of 40 days and 40 nights, the apostles are called to Mount Olivet where Jesus will see his disciples and friends the last time in his earthly existence. And he gives them a last message. He says, now go out to all the world and teach them all that I have taught you. Then baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, even though this is not biblical, one of, the, one of the apostles says to the Lord, Lord, how are we going to convert the whole world if we don't know anything? What a very humble, simple, sincere statement that one of his disciples makes to the Lord. Lord, how can we convert the world? We don't know anything. Now, the Lord does not deny that. He recognizes that they know very little. So Jesus says, okay, before you go out and you preach and convert souls, first go to the upper room. Go to the upper room. Go to the cynical. Go with my mother. Pray and fast for nine days, making the first novena. Then the promise of my Father will come upon you. And then you'll be able to preach. So they obeyed our Lord, and they went with the Blessed Mother to the cynical, the upper room, 
And after praying and fasting in silence for nine days and nine nights, Pentecost arrived and the Holy Spirit descended upon them in tongues of fire. Where they were staying, it was almost like an earthquake was shaking the very foundations of where they were praying. And these men who knew very little, these men who know very, very little, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they started in Jerusalem, but then they were shot throughout the whole world. Tomorrow we celebrate Simon and Jude. Last week we celebrated St. Luke. Next week we'll celebrate all the saints. But these men who knew very, very little and they abandoned Jesus when he was going through his suffering, they were made strong. So St. Paul says the Holy Spirit comes to our aid in our weakness. We are weak. We are very weak. But God is strong. And if we unite ourselves with God and his strength, we become strong because we have the strength of God with us. Amen. 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 Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. So, what he says, St. Paul, is we don't know how to pray but the Spirit himself intercedes with us with ineffable groans so that we can say, Abba, Father. So we can uh, say, Abba, Father. So, never get tired of exhorting all of us to rely more and more upon the Holy Spirit. Rely upon the Holy Spirit. He will help us in our weakness. That's why Teresa of Alva, when she did obey this priest, she started to pray more of the Holy Spirit. Her prayer life improved greatly. So rely upon Mary, who is the spouse of the Holy Spirit. But rely upon the Holy Spirit to give you a lot, a lot of light, a lot of insight. And invite the Holy Spirit to help you during the course of your day. So there's another verse. That follows. That I'd like to comment upon. And St. Paul says, we know that all things work for the good for those who love God. We're called according to his purpose. I'd like to comment on that. We know that all things work for the good for those who love God. So let's talk then about that concept. I would summarize these words of St. Paul in this one idea. It's called trusting in divine providence. That's right. Trusting in divine providence. By trusting in divine providence, we're able to overcome a lot of our fears, worries, and insecurities. I repeat, by trusting in divine providence, 
We're able, we're able to overcome a lot of our fears, worries, and insecurities. Divine providence is God's loving care for all of us as a loving father. Well, trusting in God's loving divine providence excludes are two things. Two things. First, it excludes going back into the past. Many of you have gone to confession. Many of you had made have made general confessions too. So, bury the past in the infinite ocean of God's mercy. Leave it. Many people do not live joyfully and peacefully in the present moment because they're still living in the past. The past you can't change. The past you can't change. Let go and let God, as they say. Let it go. Why worry about it? You know, if you love God, you trust God, you tell God you love Him and you're sorry for your past sins and you confess, you're forgiven. Why rehash and bring to the present the trash of the past? Leave it. And I invite you to read the Diary of St. Faustine, number two. Number two. Then, we shouldn't worry about the future. So those are two things we want to work on. Leave the past in God's infinite ocean of mercy. You don't worry, don't worry about the, what don't worry about the future. Because the future is beyond our grasp. The past is beyond our remedy. Leave it to God. Leave it to God. For those who love God, all things work together for the good according to his divine purpose. For those who love God, all things work together for the good. And we'll be talking about this, how God allows evil to bring greater good out of evil. So divine providence is God's fatherly care for all of his sons and daughters, that he watches over us as the very apple of his eye. Listen to what Jesus says about this topic. He talks about this topic in the very heart of what is called the Sermon on the Mount. The very heart is what is called the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, Look at the lilies of the field. Now look at the birds of the air. And Jesus says, The birds of the air, God provides for them. The lilies of the field are more beautiful than Solomon in all of his beautiful clothes or array. Jesus goes on to say also, do not worry about the food you're going to eat. Do not worry about the clothes you're going to wear. 
The pagans worry about those. Jesus says this. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be given to you beside. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be given to you beside. Seek first God. Seek first God. Then Jesus will go on on this topic of trusting in divine providence. He goes on to say that God knows how many hairs you have on your head. You probably never counted the hairs on your head. If you did count, you probably counted wrong. He also says God knows when one of the hairs fall from your head. Do not worry about tomorrow. Today has enough worries for itself. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And everything else will be given you beside. Now let me tell you where a lot of people have problems with this trust. And especially in this area. In the death of a loved one. When someone very close to us dies. Our mother, our father, our brother, our sister. Maybe a child. Very often when that happens, the devil will work on us. And the devil will bring this question to our mind. If I were only there at that time, if I had only done this, if I had only said that, then my loved one would still be with me. That process of reasoning comes from the devil. So that process of reasoning will often come from the devil himself. From the devil. And one of the stories I like to tell, especially for those who are struggling after having lost some loved one, Now I'd like to recount this story to you related to trusting in divine providence that God, as we read in the book of Job, naked he came forth from my mother's womb, naked I returned to the earth. The Lord gives. The Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If we accept good things from the Lord, should we not accept evil? Job chapter 1. I'd like you to listen carefully to this, this um, scene in the movie. The, the name of the movie is Courageous. And if you haven't seen this movie, it's worth seeing. Courageous. It's a movie of four policemen who have lived not exemplary lives and then they're converted and they become men dedicated to their families. This is what happens. Adam 
who has two children, Derek, a teenager, and a girl who's about 11 years old, allows his daughter to go to a bar birthday party. Shortly after she's left to go to the birthday party, one of his companions comes to his house and is somewhat re reluctant to going and knocking on the door, but he does. And he tells Adam that his daughter was in a car accident that a drunk driver rammed into the car where the daughter was heading to the birthday party and the daughter was in the hospital in critical critical condition. So Adam and his wife and his son, they rush to the hospital. It turns out that the doctors are huddled when the doctor comes out and says, your daughter has died. Obviously, Adam and his wife and his son, they're crestfallen at the death of their little daughter and their little sister. So shortly after that, you can see Adam sitting in front of the pastor talking. He says, Pastor, I think I'm really losing my faith. How could God allowed, have allowed my daughter to, to be taken away in such a tra tragic manner? And the pastor says this, Adam, you have two possibilities. You can either complain and regret the rest of your life for the time you didn't have your daughter, or you can thank God for the time that you did have your daughter. It's a great story. It's a great scene. And I think that speaks to us. It says you can complain for the time you didn't have your daughter or you can thank God for the time that you did have your daughter. In those happy moments of joy when he would go with her and dance with her and enjoy her presence, the father. I think that speaks to us. And St. Paul says, we know that all things work for the good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. All things work together. All things work for the good for those who love God. So we're trying to love God more and more in our lives. We're trying to give ourselves more and more fully to God. So God is challenging us to really trust Him, to trust Him all the more. God wants us to trust Him all the more. To trust Him. Now this is called, this is called, my friends, trust in divine providence. Nothing at all happens without God knowing it and willing it. And we live, my friends, we, we live, my friends, in time. God lives in the eternal present. For God, past, present, and future all converges. For us, on a good day, we can maybe see from A to C or D. 
For as God, even in the foggiest or mistiest of all days, God can see from A to Z and beyond. God knows what is good for us. He knows what is in our best interest. God is always working for, he God is working for us behind the scenes. So let's develop this theme now of divine providence. Divine providence once again means that God's fatherly and lovingly care is working always for our good. He's working behind the scenes. Even though we don't always understand it. Related to divine providence is the following, that God... In his loving divine providence, God al God allows evil in the world to bring greater good of, of that evil. And I think we should sometimes meditate upon that, that concept. I repeat, God allows evil to bring greater good out of that evil. God allows evil to bring greater good out of that evil. And if you look back in your life and you do a meditation upon the past in your life, you're going to see how God intervened. Sometimes in very painful ways, allowing certain sufferings to happen in our lives to bring greater good out of it. So here's, here's an example of this concept of divine providence and how God will allow evil to bring greater good out of the evil. The case with Adam and Eve. The case with Adam and Eve. God gave Adam and Eve freedom. God gave Adam and Eve freedom and he gave them one prohibition. Not to eat from the forbidden fruit. We all know the story in Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve, instead of obeying God, Adam and Eve disobeyed God. Disobeyed God. We call that original sin. In St. Paul in Romans chapter 5, we've already talked about the consequences of original sin is death. Death entered into the world through sin. The sin of Adam and Eve we compare to a moral tsunami. That tsunami which about 10 years ago engulfed India and other parts ended up by killing about a third of a million people. That was a physical disaster. A physical disaster. So this sin of Adam and Eve was a moral disaster that is a, you might call it a spiritual tsunami that has repercussions until the very end of the world. What a disaster. And all the evil that we suffer, suffer in our lives, in the society, in our families, it all stem and originates in that first sin of Adam and Eve. Starts in that. The fact that we have darkness of intellect, weakness in our will, we get sick, we have tensions, 
We have quarrels and misunderstandings, emotional problems, sadness and depression. All of this comes as a result of the original sin of Adam and Eve. A real catastrophe, you might say. Now, how did God react? How did God react? God did not abandon us. but rather in the fullness of time. In the fullness of time, God sent to us our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, born of a woman, and that is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So God allowed the sin of Adam and Eve, original sin, to bring forth something that was much greater. And that would be the incarnation of the Son of God. In the Easter Vigil Mass, we sing the exalted. O happy fault, O happy fault of our first parents, Adam and Eve this happy fault brought forth our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin Mary. And his life on earth, his passion, death, and resurrection. So if it were not for this first sin in the world, the sin of Adam and Eve, then the whole rea reality of Christ, Jesus Christ becoming one of us living in this world, showing us how to live. He dying for us on Calvary, rising from the dead, opening up the gates to heaven. And if that were not enough, then he said, I, I will not leave you orphans, but I will send another one, the paraclete, to be, to be with you. And he said, I will be with you always, even until the end of the world. I'll be with you always, even until the end of the world. What consoling words they are. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So not only did Jesus come into the world as a man, he suffers for us, he dies for us, he rises from the dead for us. But also, he will not leave us orphans. But rather, he says, I'll be with you always until the end of the world. How is it that Jesus is with us until the end of the world? If he ascends and he goes through the skies and he sits at the right hand of his heavenly Father, how is he with us? He is with us, my friends, in his mystical body, the church. That's the way he's with us. He's with us in the mystical body, the church. And through the church, he communicates to us, especially through his sacraments. The sacraments that we can receive frequently, we should receive frequently, are confession and communion. We 
For those who love God, all things work together for the good. For those who love God, all things work together for the good. I invite all of you to pray over this. And maybe re re rewind the film of your life. And see how God has been working in your life. He's been behind the scenes. He's been maneuvering events. He's been placing persons maybe in your path. See how God allowed certain sufferings maybe to happen in your life to bring a greater good out of it. So God will allow evil things to happen, but to bring greater good out of them. I'd like to tell you one, and then uh, invite all of you to meditate upon your own lives. This is a personal anecdote, and you all have your own. I invite you to kind of pray through this to ask the Holy Spirit to see how God intervened in your life in a powerful way through suffering through the cross to bring a lot of good out of it. When I was about 14, God intervened in a very powerful way. 14, um, I happened to be a very good athlete at school as well as in, in sports outside of school. And I really love baseball. I played Pony League. I was a pitcher. I pitched my first no-hitter. I won the Presidential Award of Physical Fitness. Uh, I was really at, at the top of my game when I was probably about 14. Doing well in school, having a lot of friends. And see what happened. I, do, I did two things were not very smart. I was running too much and the cartilage in my knee loosened so I couldn't run. Then to make things worse, in the middle of the winter, I was throwing snowballs. See if I could throw snowballs over a certain building. And they ended up by ruining my arm. So both my leg and my arm were, were, were injured, were damaged. So I enter into high school having these physical gifts, these athletic gifts, but I couldn't use them. because of the damaged knee and the the ripped tendons, whatever it was. And I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. I made these endless novenas to St. Jude, who, by the way, it's his feast day tomorrow. Simon and Jude. I prayed and prayed and prayed. I stormed heaven for weeks, for months, for about two years. So for those two years, ninth and tenth grade, I was out of commission. My friends were able to play sports, but I was not... And it was, in, it was excruciatingly painful to be sitting on the sideline and not being able to be active 
in what I really loved most, which was sports, especially that of baseball. Then finally, after a couple of years, the arm and the leg were healed. I entered into play baseball, I made varsity, but I wasn't spectacular. But those two years that I lost were the two years when I felt that I was at my best, when I would have and could have performed great. But it never happened. What could have happened, I've thought about this the past couple of years. If I kept progressing, getting better and better as I got older in those high school years, who knows? Maybe I could have played professional. I think maybe I would have made the minor leagues. To make the major leagues is almost impossible. Then if I were to have entered into the minor leagues, traveling from one city to the next, with the many temptations that are out there, many temptations, with a lot of free time and drinking and somewhat of a wild lifestyle, could have been very, very easy for me to have distanced myself away from God, giving up prayer, giving up the sacramental life, and falling into moral, moral misery, moral disaster. So I see it this way. God said, God said, here is your suffering. I'm going to deprive you of what you what you think is best is playing sports. But I'm going to give you something which is better than playing sports. I'm going to give you the grace and vocation of holy orders, which is the priesthood. Now I look back in great with great gratitude because look at it this way. If I, even I were a professional baseball player, I would already be retired 25 years. Professional baseball players usually do not play beyond their late 30s or their 40s or 40. So I've got 25 years beyond that and I feel that I'm in my prime now. Thanks be to God. But when I was going through when I was going through that suffering, my friends, having a torn something in my arm, the cartilage that was loosened underneath my knee, I couldn't play any sports. I was praying, I was storming heaven. I was hoping for the best. We went to some doctors. And it's almost as if God God's voice was silent, almost as if God were hiding his face. I couldn't see God's face and I couldn't hear his voice. It was very, very painful. Very painful. But now as I remove, I rewind the film of my life. I see God's providential hand in my life. Maybe you remember the poem, Footsteps in the Sand. Footsteps in the Stand. You could see two sets of footsteps. Then you could just see two footsteps. And the person asked Jesus, why do I see two steps of footsteps in the sand? Then I see only two footsteps. 
Jesus goes on to say, you saw the two sets of footsteps. Well, you're walking side by side with me when things are going pretty well. But there was one foot of set of footsteps when you're suffering most because I carried you in my arms. Sometimes God is carrying us in his arms. He's carrying us in his arms when we're suffering most and we're not even aware of it. I believe that our Lord and his Blessed Mother were carrying me in their arms in those painful years. But I was not aware of it. But now as you look back in retrospect, I see how good God is. How good God is. How loving God is. So that is our conversation today. St. Paul says, for those who love God, all things work for, for for those who love God, all things work together for the good. And God allows evil in our lives. It can be physical evil, sometimes even moral evil. God allows it. God allows it to happen so as to bring greater good from that physical or moral evil. So rewind the film of your life. As St. Paul says, let the Holy Spirit intercede for you. And be aware of our God as a loving Father. He's always, he's always working behind the scene. He's working behind the scene for our good. In time, but especially for all eternity. God is working so that one day, as the gospel points out, will many be saved. God is working for us, beckoning us to take the narrow path so that the gates of heaven will be wide open for us. I let you give my priestly blessing. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.